Isn't it a sweet time of worship just to, oof, just to slow everything down? Turn off the news, turn off your feed, and uh, hear from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords about, uh, I'm sorry, I have my hat on, um, about his goodness and his justice and his grace. So let me see. First time I rode on a plane. Do you all remember the first time you rode on an airplane for the very first time? Well, let me ask this. Who hasn't ridden on an airplane? Anyone in here who has not? Yeah. <laughs> so I was 10 the first time I rode on an airplane. Uh, we grew up fairly poor. Um, and so there was this trip that my grandfather funded. It meant a lot to me in my life. I'd bring him up with plenty in sermons. Um, and he wanted us to experience New York City. So... <laughs> I was so excited. I remember the, I had dreams like nightmares really like the, the whole week before getting on an airplane. And I remember, seriously, I still remember the dream. It was taking off and then it just went vertical like this. And I remember being like, and everyone's just normal reading their books and they're just all like this. And like, how does it get in the air, mom? She goes, well, it, it has to go like this. So I really didn't know that it doesn't do this until you're kind of like doing this like, oh, wow, this is really cool. But I, I remember that moment getting on and, and finally getting up in the air and you're at cruising altitude. Something changes, right? Clint's a pilot now, so he really gets it. I don't know what his experience is. I don't want to be a pilot. I don't know why he's doing it, but he's decided to be a pilot. Anyway, <laughs> sorry for throwing into the bus, Clint. So, but being, you know, Pastor, you're, you're, all your trust is in, is in the pilot driving the airplane, and you know you're not on the ground anymore. That's all I can explain for those of you, everyone here who's been on an airplane. It's just a different experience, you know. And, and I was come to thinking that is the same kind of experience believers have when they come to Christ. They go from death, okay, let's say you're here on the ground, and you're, you're in an airplane. You're not quite in heaven yet, but you're the closest to hell you'll ever be. You're the closest to um, eternal torment that you'll ever be if you're a believer. And there's, there's beauty in that. God doesn't kick his people off the plane. <laughs> he doesn't kick his people off the plane, you know. And, and there's, there's magic about that. There's something really special to know that, that he's got you, he has you. But that is the Christian experience that I really believe Paul is having us try to understand in this chapter, okay? And in, in theology, eschatology, we call this the now and not yet. There's something that is drastically changed in the world. Jesus said that his kingdom is now. Yet, it's not here yet. So there's a tension, right? There's something happening. And so that is called the now and not yet. Just something to keep in your hat here a little bit. So our connection to the last sermon was talking through Pastor Tim, walked us through. We learned in our study on the saving faith that I was counted to Abraham as righteousness. And really, we're getting this backstory that Paul is trying to reiterate that the, the, the message of faith as an act from God to his people and that response being from the one he's bringing that relationship to has been a common theme throughout the whole redemption story. This isn't anything new. And so that's what Tim really helped us unpack last week. So that's an important bedrock and, and bed of knowledge for us to understand before we walk into Romans chapter 5. So we're going to be going through Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. So if you would, open in your Bibles with me. 5, chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. I won't have it up here in the screen. I'll have our main points up in the screen, but I really want us in our Bible study time to be digging in the scriptures and flipping those pages, it's, it's a good thing. That's a good thing. So I want us to get in that practice as we're diving in on these Wednesday nights. And I really appreciate those that have come and making this a priority. Um, I talked to a few uh, folks this week 
And sometimes I think there's this struggle like, ah, I didn't get my study done. Please still come. There's value in, in joining in discussion, hearing the preaching of the word and worship. We want to encourage you. Do your study. That is, that is for, it's a gift for you in your relationship with Jesus. So verses 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin did not, is not counted where there is no law. We're going to unpack that verse later. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for me. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's disobedience, that many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray that the Lord would open our eyes this evening. God, we pray that as we dive deeper here in the next few minutes, that you would open our eyes to see as the children of God, your words, your truth, your mercies screaming from your texts for your people to know and be assured with your grace, your mercy. Let it be true for us tonight. In your glorious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So my main proposition this evening is the life in Christ versus the death in Adam. The life in Christ versus the death in Adam. My purpose this evening is to help us celebrate the life and righteousness that we now have in Jesus. To celebrate the life and righteousness that we now have in Jesus. Let's start there in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. So that word therefore, of course, is it's trying to help us unpack and, and Paul does these types of almost semi run-on sentences and he's, he's like so excited, therefore, therefore, and he really doesn't really finish previous thoughts. He's like, I just need you to hear grace. I just need you to hear that God's righteousness is being poured out on all of humanity. And you've got to listen to this. So there's a lot of these, therefores, therefore, therefore, okay? This is one of those. And so he's referring just back to the previous uh, preaching portion, which we don't have time to really go through every preaching portion on Wednesday nights. We really unpack a particular preaching portion that suits um, the chapter best. But in the beginning previously in verses 1 through 11 um, here is obviously giving a relationship to Paul's previous point the relationship is he re what is he referring to in the previous point if you are in Christ God has indeed saved you in verses 1 through 11 ex it explains how God's love is so strong it's so deep it's so immersive beyond anything we could ever accomplish on our own it says that Christ died for his enemies at the exact time that it was necessary and needed. And even while those same people he redeemed were sinners, enemies of God, children of wrath, he chose in that very moment to save us. That's good news. We cannot miss this, that his extravagant love, that when you're at your worst, graces abound so much more in your life when you're broken he's all the more great in your life that's good news for us 
He goes on to explain the best possible scenario for a person is to die for someone you love and people that love you back. So he's explaining in verses 1 through 11 that the greatest best scenario for most people is to lay down your life for people that are pretty good. But Jesus, his love was so great that he laid down his life for enemies. So we see Paul digging deeper when he mentions the word sin here in verses 12, just as sin came into the world and entered it through Adam. The word sin here plays a very active role in the original language. So when you see the word sin here, you want to think of the words such as it's, it, it's obeyed by humanity, sin pays wages, it seizes opportunity, it deceives and it kills. So when you think of sin in this context, we want to think of it like, a, like an infection and a disease, that its source is all of mankind who was birthed from Adam. Who's all birthed from Adam? <laughs> Okay, that means we are born into sin with this infection. But that infection isn't stagnant. It's active. And it spreads. It spreads like wildfire. So sin has played an active role in history. And that we're about to dig more into that. And this sin and death has spread to all mankind because of Adam. So early on here in, in this preaching portion, we're starting to see this distinctive binary of understanding beginning to develop, or beginning to be explained from Paul to believers. So if we are Bible-believing, Christ-loving Christians, we have to believe the simple truth that anyone without Christ is in spiritual death, and with their own power, they cannot escape it. That they are born unto death because of Adam. They physically die because of Adam. And then they die a spiritual death in hell forever without Christ. Paul lays it clear for us that there is no reversing this clear teaching of all scripture. That's why you often see Paul referring back to the Old Testament. Because he's saying this is rooted deep as, a, as far back as Adam. It's inescapable without Jesus. In verse 13, it says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. That text sounds kind of tricky, doesn't it? Do you see what it says there in verses 13? Has everyone noticed that text before? For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. So this text is a bit tricky, but I'll do my best here. This text has raised a bit of confusion in regards to the impact of original sin and what that looks like. And remember, as people who believe in the word of God as God's inspired word, we always must reform to the scripture, okay? We don't reform to a set of a theologian set of ideas. Those, though, those are very helpful and their commentary is a blessing. We always go to the scriptures. What does God's word have to say? We don't follow men and tradition. We follow the word of God. That's an important thing. So as uh, our, our church has a distinctive being reformed Baptist, okay? That's not a scary word. All it means is that we reform our context and interpretation of Scripture from the Scriptures. We reform ourselves to the Scriptures, okay? But this text itself has raised a bit of confusion. Is Paul saying there's no consequence for sin? Hmm. No, he's not saying that, okay? He's saying that death and consequence for sin that was passed down to Adam affected all of Adam's children. And that consequence was death. Yet, before Moses, before the tablets were given, individual sinners' law-based consequence, the civil order of the Jewish people, there was obviously no consequence for those particular 
there was no judgment in the theocracy for that immediate old covenant. Does that make sense? So the old covenant was given on Mount Sinai to people, and it was a way for us to understand how we're breaking God's law, not a measurement of righteousness, but a measurement of brokenness. Okay? The law was given not as a measurement of righteousness, I'm better than you, but a measurement of brokenness. I'm, I'm lost because God has told me so, okay? For instance, there are 613 laws further down in, in the people of Israel, and they didn't have those yet. Similar to, you know, if, if America was, was formed and planted before the Constitution, there was a governing order of general common law, both from England that was passed down through it, but then we had our own constitution that had to be ratified. It was from that point on that you could point back to the constitution and say, I have rights in this area. In this similar way, that's how it was for the people of God before the law was given to Moses. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. This is powerful. Here, verse 15, let's move on. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift. By the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, in verse 16. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So the gift is not like the trespass of sin. The goodness of God supersedes everything previous in a way we cannot even fathom. So the cross of Christ and the resurrection of the Son of God, that victory trumps death a million times over. Okay, so whenever you, you hear deceptive words in your mind from the enemy about your, your, your past life and your shame and how you, you should feel condemned for that and, and you were not worthy to enter into heaven, you could say, I'm not worthy. You're right. That's why I need Jesus. And he counted me as righteous. And his righteousness covers a multitude of sins deeper than the ocean. Amen? That's good news. That's great. That means we could never out God's grace. We can never do it. His grace is that strong. Now, we're going to learn more about sanctification and what that looks like. But what we're trying to understand here is the depth of the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ, trumps the death of the first Adam. The life that we have in Jesus supersedes a million times over the death of Adam. This free, this free unrivaled gift is one of the most kind acts of God to his people. Think about this. Because of one act of sin, the cumulative activity of sins that, sins that outnumber and what we could ever count of God's people who had sinned against him as children of wrath before he redeemed them was wiped away clean by the one act of obedience of Jesus Christ. It's pretty powerful if you think about that. It's amazing. And the wonder, awe of God's grace can never escape us. If you ever get bored of the gospel, I'm Dig into God's word, pray, confess your sin, and you'll be all the more rejoicing over Jesus and his gospel. Amen. So what's astonishing about Paul's binary view of all of history and time is that he really tries to give us this picture that all the gifts that come in Christ supersede the death of Adam and, and it's amplified we're no longer chained to the trespass of Adam for those who have faith and belief in Christ Jesus, that God's life really does change something in us. It says that grace would reign in righteousness in verses 21, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You almost get this echo and this call for for Christians to live virtuously rather than in, in constant abstinence. Does that make sense? So if you live virtuously, that means you are looking for opportunities to spread the kingdom of God wherever you go, to spread the life and the message and the goodness of Jesus 
wherever you plant your feet. That's what he's emphasizing here. He's not calling for us just to mull over our history over and over and over again. I know for some of you, I grew up in a very legalistic upbringing. Very legalistic. Heavy. Really, every, every time church happened, it was like an altar call and I got re-saved again and again and again and again. You know? I don't know if you all remember those revival meetings as kids. I grew up in the church. I know some of you all didn't. There was these things called tent revivals, okay? They took up tents and, you know, let's go for it. Really bad sound systems and PA systems. <clears throat> I don't know who got away with that, but they did. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, you know, the, at the end of the service, five hours later, you know, it'd be like, okay, it's time for altar call. Do I just go up so I can go home and go to sleep? What do I do here? How do we move on? And I'm, I'm not mocking it. Hear me out, okay? What I'm saying is there was a Christian subculture that created this identity in, in losing your salvation all the time. And you needed to go back over and over and over and over and over again. And what we see here is Paul saying, lay aside the death of Adam and live in the life of Christ. Yes, confess, repent, move. A life of Christianity is a life of repentance because if you see the grace of God, you see a life of repentance. There's... It's like how Luther explained. It's like explaining separating light and heat from fire. You just don't, you can't do it, okay? And so, but I do want us to understand living an abundant life doesn't just have to be something that Joel Osteen said. Really. I think sometimes as Reformed Baptists, we throw a lot of stones at concepts, right, that have little seeds of truth in there. One of the seeds is, we're seeing here the abundant life in Christ is to be spread across the whole world, preaching the gospel, baptizing the name of the people, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and seeing the kingdom of God spread throughout the earth. That's an abundant life. That's a good thing. Because without the abundant life of Christ, we see tr just travesty happening all over the world. We're seeing it with our own eyes, the disgust without Jesus. It's, it's mind-blowing. And yet, this is what we hear, what natural death of Adam people do. They got nothing else but death. There is no abundant life outside of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says in, in John, he speaks of the living water. So if you're not in Christ and you're not bathing in the living water of God, you're in the death lake that's stagnant. <laughs> that's really what he's saying because there's an antecedent to the message. I'm going to wrap this up here really quick, I promise. I told the guys I wouldn't preach long. Okay, here we go. This part of Romans makes me think of the Chronicles of Narnia. Who loves the Chronicles of Narnia? Oh, goodness, yes. I heard they're coming out with the new series. I hope it's good. And C.S. Lewis has such a great way of describing this difference of landscape between the land of death and the land of life. He gives such a great description of the land that's always being winter, but never Christmas. I don't know if you remember that piece. And those are those lines where like, only C.S. Lewis could figure that one out. But yes, that's so awesome. You know, it just does something to your heart. But I don't know why. I know this time of year, that in-between stage when it starts to get colder, has not been normal for me since it was, I think it was in 2021, November, I got covid and so whenever I see, like, the clouds, like, get all weird and, like, overcast, and I'm just like, COVID, that's all I think about now. And it's like this, like, looming thing, like, when am I going to get it? Remember when we were all thinking like that? It's, it's like a ticking time bomb, sort of. But really, fall and winter seem to always come at the worst timing for me. And, and more and more as I get an adult, see myself not enjoying the season as much. It seems more and more exciting waiting for that day of Christmas to be this delightful hope in the midst of such winter death, you know. And if anyone's met Brittany, she really doesn't like winter. <laughs> in fact, you almost have to invite her to church every Sunday. Come on, it's okay. <laughs> you got this. Uh, I love her. I think she's listening right now. Um, but see, just as in Narnia, that when the witch was defeated, you see in the movie too, you see these notes, these, these glimmers of life, these leaves that start to blossom on the trees, and it starts to return as it was always intended. 
That's what Jesus did for us. He brought the good news of the gospel to start bringing these seeds of life throughout the whole earth, to bring the message of the kingdom and reclaim what was lost in, in Adam all over the world and to preach the good news. So this life that we have in Christ is to be celebrated. So what does this have to do with me? What does this message mean for me? And I don't mean that in a narcissistic way as listeners as we're doing the scriptures, but we do need to apply the text to our lives. We need to say, okay, I listened, I learned. Um, I heard, I heard one, one of my teachers say, okay, you, you preached all the text. Now what? Now what do we do with that? Well, the main takeaway from, from this would be that our union with Christ far outweighs your past death. This means it is worth to celebrate because when you were in sin, you couldn't help yourself. But now in Christ, you have the weapon of the Spirit of God living within you to crush your enemies. So when you're facing trials and tribulations, when you are facing those suffering moments in your life and and death feels like it's looming in. As a child of God, you have a beautiful opportunity and duty to spread the kingdom of God, which is life to the ends of the earth. So you are actively combating the spirit of death with Jesus, with his power, not your own, but as a willing vessel and servant. So in the ancient Hebrew mind, this was a distinctive way for someone to make a choice when facing a hard decision. They would ask themselves, okay, this feels a little gray. What will produce the most life in this decision? And this is how we must live for God in this present age. This is how we raise our families. This is how we go to work. This is how we worship. How can I give God the most glory by spreading his kingdom of life through the whole world, which is through Jesus. See, the life given in Jesus Christ is immeasurable. And as a Christian, he has given you the door. Who is Jesus Christ to experience this good life until forever? Let's pray, and then we'll break out into our groups. Dear God, thank you for your grace, your mercy, your peace, love, and joy that you give to your people. We pray that as we dive into our groups, that our hearts would be transparent and that we would, we would walk through this study together, celebrating fellowship and encouraging one another in the spirit. In your name.